Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the gathering place here in beautiful Simi Valley, California. She knows I got my California stuff on. As a matter of fact, I ordered a bunch of California shirts and jackets. Why? Because I'm praying and I'm interceding over the state of California. Whenever I'm traveling back and forth from, from here to Carlsbad, I'm praying. And it's interesting, we went to, um, uh, uh, Michael got me a, he got me a seat at um, a Kevin's Adai meeting last night, which is why it's Thursday. <clears throat> but it's interesting that he sensed a fire over Carlsbad in the portal. But there are no spiritual churches in Carlsbad. So what do you, what do you think happened? You know what? I don't know exactly but I know at least one person there that's praying a lot. Amen. And one Moses can do more than three million Israelites. Yeah. And if you'll notice that everything we've been declaring over the last couple of months has been starting to happen over our state, which we'll, I'll, I'll declare in a minute. But first, let me say, uh, I know I just uh, uh, spoke something to Dana, but I want to say also happy birthday to Dana. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And Beverly, good night. Happy birthday, Beverly. And uh, Nora's was Thursday, but we want to say happy birthday, Nora. And Yolanda is not here. She's backslidden in. Uh, um, she's backslidden in Vegas. No, I don't know. She may not be there. Anyway, anyways, uh, so. Uh, a quick announcement, this coming uh, Thursday, Dr. Barry Lenhart is going to be here and, um, you know, as he uh, worships, so, so from 6 to 7 as we worship, normally we, we would have a Rodney or somebody on the piano, but Rodney's still going to be out of town, uh, but Barry is going to be playing and then he's going to be speaking Thursday night and then um, I'm sure that he will play for us Friday morning from 10 to 12 as we pray and then he will also be here Saturday. And he is, he is one of the deepest revelators um, that I've listened to. And I, um, you know, Michael and I were at, at Kevin's at Eyes, and he, for me, the thing that was, that was impactful to me was almost everything he was saying, we've been saying here Amen. for the last year. And um, I know he's like a prophet, maybe even a seer, <clears throat> but he's, everything he was saying, we've been saying. And so it was, it was really, that was a blessing. It took him four hours to say it. I think I could have said it in an hour, but I may be wrong. But, but Michael, every once in a while he'd hit me because we were talking about stuff before the meeting. Going, hey, we were just talking about that. So I believe the Spirit of God is saying things, and it's easy to get caught up in all the prophets talking about what's coming next, but really a lot of what God is saying is he's teaching us to be to be not just disciples of Christ, but to be kings, to, be, to walk as sons of God Amen. and to declare things, Amen. which we've been doing with a lot of, um, a lot of effectiveness. Amen. All right, so let me go over this with you. Now, I know everybody hates finances, <laughs> and, um, but if, you, if you're really interested in finances, which I know you're not, and I'm going to be really serious, memorize Proverbs 8. And I would say even the first five verses of Proverbs 7, and then memorize it also in the Passion Translation. Don't seek the finances, but seek the spirit of wisdom. Amen. Now, the spirit of wisdom is one of the seven spirits of God. Because I was sitting, I, mean, I was about nine months ago, I was just sitting there and going, God, why am I so blessed? Like in every, every area of my life, I'm just so blessed. What did I do right? You know, it's like if you're working out, all of a sudden you're getting these gains, you go, hey, what and you'd have to think back, what am I doing right? Yeah. And I was thinking, what am I doing right? And he, just the Holy Spirit just spoke to me, because goes, you've been engaging in the spirit of wisdom, like, duh. But I wasn't engaging wisdom for finances or gains or anything, I was engaging wisdom to, to have a relationship. Because she says, I love them that love me. Those that seek me early shall find me. Riches and honor are with me. Yea, durable riches and righteousness. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of the paths of judgment that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance. Amen. So when you, look at the, when you look at the Americas, the pilgrims came here seeking God. 
The Spanish came to South America seeking riches. Who has the riches? Those that sought the riches or those that sought the Lord? These two, the, and the, the natural resources are just as abundant. When you seek the riches, you don't get them. But when you seek the Lord, or you get them, but you have sorrow with it. But when you seek the Lord, you get them. However, I'm going to read a couple of these verses to you, because we did, a, we did a couple of sheets, and I don't know if we have any with you, Randy. Yeah. But we have some financial sheets of all these scriptures, and I don't know, there may be 30 or 40, I'm not, I don't remember but these are just scriptures that talk about God's promises for financial blessing. And it's because God wants to bless you. He wants to bless our nation. He wants to bless the world, but he can't do it. Why is, why is, it, why is India a place with such great resources and so many people? Why is there so much poverty there? It's because of the worshiping of all the false gods. And so these gods, because they're not, they are gods, but they're false gods but they can never prosper the people because they don't have it. But God can prosper the people because he does have it. And you can see that anywhere in the world. You can, you could, listen, we put billions of dollars into Haiti and everybody's just as poor there now as they ever were, except for the Clintons. Anyways. <laughs> it's common knowledge, sorry. So Proverbs 10.22 says what? The blessing of the Lord, it makes What? And he has no sorrow with it. Isaiah 48, 17. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches thee to, to profit, which leads thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Who is the richest man that ever lived and the richest kingdom ever known? Solomon. Solomon. Did he seek riches? No. When God came to him, he said, give me wisdom to guide your people. And God said, you haven't sought riches and honor, but I'm going to give them to you. But he said, I'm going to give you wisdom. And it was his wisdom that opened the door. Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And to be honest, that's a, that's a scripture. We did a teaching on that on a Thursday. Go back and listen to that to really get the full understanding of that. 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish or pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in hell. So this is the great apostle John, and he said, He prayed above all things that we would what? We'd be in health and that we would prosper as our soul prospers. So once your soul is in the right place, God wants to prosper you. Listen, any poverty anywhere on the face of the earth has never come from God. Now, you may have been broke in your life, and that's okay. Because it's not, it's not bad to be broke at least once in your life to just know what it's like. But it's not a good place to stay. Isaiah 119, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. That means you'll drive the good of the land, live in the good of the land. Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Deuteronomy 8, 18, we just discussed the other night, went through the whole chapter, Deuteronomy 8. If thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he sworn to thy fathers as it is this day. Which brings us to today's scripture. Psalm 23, 1, you know, this is the one that you learned as a kid. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside you. So, we know this, but this verse, verse says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I looked it up in a lot of different versions, and it, it, that's what it means. You will not have lack, you will not have want. If the Lord is your shepherd, if he's leading you, you will not have want. Amen. And David, David was a shepherd, so he understood what it meant. Now, I find this interesting that on the Super Bowl weekend, there are two teams, the 49ers and the Chiefs, Kansas City Chiefs, um, who also played in the Super Bowl in 2020. And there was an election going on between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And right now, there's an election going on between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. <laughs> kind of interesting. Bob, do you know who's going to win? No, I knew who was going to win that one, but I don't know who's going to win. Um, but I, I thought it was interesting that when the, the owner of the Kansas City Chief, when they handed him the trophy for the AFC, that's winning the one half, what did he do? He put it up there and he said, I want to give glory to God. Wow. Yep. But then the quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers, it's a whole thing, somebody sent me a clip, 
It's the whole thing. When he was going through college, he says, every day when I would get up, he goes, I would read Psalm, the 23rd Psalm, <laughs> and meditate on it. He goes, I did it first thing in the morning. Now, I didn't have this, I didn't put that in there because he said that. That just happens to be the order in which we have the scriptures. As you can see, if you read through them, you'll see that's the order we have them. I believe it's a message to, the, to really us and anybody in the body of Christ that, hey, let the Lord be your shepherd and you won't want. Don't trust the government. As a matter of fact, don't trust the elections. Trust your faith in God. Amen. And you notice everything we've been saying over the last couple of months, once we start saying it, what happens? It starts happening. Amen. And a couple of things which you'll, which you'll touch on today, actually, and actually, I think we could touch on them right now. In Malachi 3, he talks about, and we realize that Malachi 3 was under the law, but he talks about the promises of tithing and off, tithes and, tithes and offering. And the promise is this, I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. And, and, and he said, in other words, God said, I'm going to judge the darkness in your land. But you have to call him for it. And then he said, when you bring the tithe to the storehouse, he, said, I will, he goes, I will open the windows of heaven. So last year, about three weeks before the rain started coming, four weeks, some of you were here and remember, I just heard the word, the rain is coming, the rain is coming. And so we started saying, the rain is coming, the rain is coming. That was something I learned from Kim Clement. When you get a prophetic word, you just keep saying it over and over. Amen. The rain is coming. And then the Lord just spoke to me and he said, it's gonna, not going to be a monsoon, but it's going to be steady and consistent. It's going to keep coming until the drought is gone. Amen. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Well, how did God do that in a, a little church? It, it's not the size of the church. It's the size of the prayer warriors. Yeah. If you can pray, one Moses can do more than three million Israelites. Amen. It's how well you know God. And so the people that night prophesied. We prophesied, and it happened. But something else happened. As we've been going through Malachi, so he said, I will, he, goes, he goes, prove me in this. So we, we prove him. And he said, I will open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive. We know that that is rain, but it also can be blessings for our life. And he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. So what did we start doing? And I don't know if you remember this. When the gas prices were up high, we started calling down inflation and calling, saying, Lord, we, we receive the gas prices rebuked for your sake. Amen. Did you notice that a couple weeks afterwards, it started going down? And inflation started going down. Amen. What did we do just recently, just several weeks ago? Crime. We call that crime. Okay, so let me tell you a couple things that happened since we've done that. It's just about three weeks now, but there's a couple things that happened. Number one, our governor, and, and people say, I don't like any, you know, and they call him nuisance and everything else, but pray for him. But he was in a Target, and somebody was walking out with $380 worth of merchandise. Now, as you know, the looting has been going on all, all over the Southland, the worst in the San Francisco area, but even Topanga, they had just a big looting spree out here, just on our own backyard. <clears throat> and so it's been going on all over Southern California. Um, there's a change of the law, but I don't think the governor knew that. Because, and he goes, why aren't you stopping them? And they go, oh, it's, it's Governor Newsom. <laughs> and, and she was talking to Governor Newsom. <laughs> he, and he, he was offended. He was angry about it. Yep. He didn't realize that the laws that, that were enacted right now give people the right to do that, that you can't even touch them. Right. I mean, you, technically you can't. He didn't know that, and, and she said, and then she realized it was the governor. She said, oh, can I take a picture? And he goes, no, I want to talk to your manager. He's all upset about it. Yep. That's a wake-up call. Yeah. Amen. So he's starting to wake up. Then he decided to send, because in and out burgers going out in Oakland, he's sending 150 highway patrol to Oakland. Wow. Well, what happened? You began to declare the crime coming down, and what happened? Two, three weeks later, crime's coming down. Come on. Amen. Amen. And the next thing, what's the next thing? Well, we just started it the other week, and that's a transformation of the school systems. Yeah. We're not waiting for elections. We're not waiting for politicians. We're going to begin to declare things over our country. I don't care who's in office. 
and God's going to bless them. Because, listen, Daniel, Daniel did not have the dream of the future of the empires, but Nebuchadnezzar did. Daniel had the interpretation, but Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. Joseph did not have the dreams about the future of the abundance and drought that was coming. It was the Pharaoh who was an ungodly man. He wasn't a godly man. I don't, I don't believe he was a bad man. I think he's probably a good man. But who had the dream? Pharaoh. Joseph interpreted the dream. And so there can, you can have wrong people in places, but God can touch them. And so we can't just say, well, we're going to wait till... No, there's no waiting till. So we are, going to receive, we are going to receive the offering this morning. So if you're making out your checks, please make them out to the gathering place or those that give to Soaring Ministries. And if you're giving by text, it's already up there. And we have envelopes here for anybody's giving cash. And if, listen, if you write out a check, you don't need to put it in an envelope unless you have a prayer request or something like that. But one of the things I really like that Kevin Zadai said, he's like, he's like, we've been training, he goes, we've been, the ministry, we've been training people to rely on us to pray for them. I'm like, that's not what we've been doing. <laughs> and he goes, we need to teach people to pray for themselves. And then he goes to Luke 11, I'm going, funny, you've just been teaching on that. time for the body of Christ to become exactly that, the sons of God with authority and dominion yeah. over darkness and over our state. Amen. And I, like I said, I, I'm wearing the California thing because we have dominion and we're exercising over the state of California because right. this is our state. This is God's state. Yeah. It doesn't belong to the devil. Yeah. All right. So here we go. Pray this with me. <sighs> Father in heaven, we are so grateful, so grateful for, the mercy and grace for the mercy and grace that you have poured out upon us. I receive it into my life right now. We receive it into our state. Lord Jesus, as our high priest, we ask you to present our tithes and offerings unto our Father. As an offering in righteousness, as, righteousness. As, a as a sweet savor, and heavenly Father, and heavenly Father we, humble we humble ourselves by proving you in this way, in this way. And, we and we receive the opening of the windows of heaven, windows of heaven to, pour to pour out a blessing, there's not room enough to receive, enough to receive. and we thank you Father, we thank you, Father for, rebuking for rebuking the devourer of crime in the state of California, state of California. For, rebuking the for rebuking the unholy school systems and transforming them, by transforming them. In, the in the state of California. We thank you for the gas prices coming down and rebuking the inflation. We receive it all, we receive it all. In, the in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Go ahead, ushers. Is it that simple? It's that simple if you have authority. It's just that simple. Amen. And while the, while the ushers are doing that, I'm going to have AJ come up here in a second, maybe grab the mic, AJ. But one of the things I was saying was there are deliverance ministries where people learn to do deliverance, and then they, they kind of almost see demons and everything. And which we need people to know how to know how to cast out demons for sure. But what happens is sometimes they're not demons, it's just somebody has a messed up soul. Yeah. And their soul needs to be healed. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And you can try to cast out as many demons as you want, they're not coming out. But I'll tell you what, if you're full of the Holy Ghost and you pray enough and you get, in, you get close to a demon, I guarantee you they're going to manifest. That's right. oh, yeah. I know, because I've done it so many times. Yes. They could be around other people, nothing. They get around you and you're praying a lot, they're going to manifest. 100%. But 
Sometimes you be around somebody and there's not, nothing manifest. Why? Because it's, their soul needs to be touched and their soul needs to be affected. These are the things that we have to begin to understand. Now, when it comes to healing, there are a lot of demons involved and they affect people's bodies, but they also have to touch their souls. All right, before I get too far into this, let me call AJ up here. You had, um, he had a dream. Let me see. I got to turn it on. There we go. He's going to share a dream that he had about the church, and I thought it was, I thought it was very interesting. So go ahead. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Take, take the pulpit. Oh, yeah. You're the man. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, last Friday, um, I was getting ready to go to bed, and before that, I've been just meditating on the Word of God, especially the healing met scriptures and the father was telling me not knowing that we've been teaching on healing because you i haven't been here yeah, been there. I've been, yeah so we've been right on sync this entire time which tells me this church god is moving it tells me that Amen. and so i've been meditating on the healing and the father was telling me you know i want you to meditate until you know that you know and then when you know it then you speak it as me so I took that and I just kept speaking the healing scriptures and I started noticing that there's a tooth that I had lost because of martial arts. I got hit and it cracked and then over time it just, it just died. So I, I spoke those scriptures over myself and, I, and I basically I was preaching it to my wife and all of a sudden I started noticing I'm getting a tooth I, and, and it, it's cutting through but because it's cutting through I'm teething at 36, <laughs> as my wife says. So I go to bed uh, last Friday, and I, I, the Father was just giving me this great revelation about just my sonship in him. Amen. And I, I'm, I'm in bed, and my face starts to hurt, because also with this cutting through, I'm, I can, I'm sensitive to like the pressure change in weather. So I could feel, and rain was coming, and so now, my face is in pain for about an hour. I'm still in bed trying to get to sleep because I'm excited that, like, the father told me, I'm going to te tell you something tonight. So I'm trying to get to sleep so I can get this message, but my tooth is distracting me. So then the father, after two or three hours, the father goes, meditate on the sonship that I've been telling you about. Meditate that you are my son. You are my son. Believe that you are my son and nothing is impossible. So I started doing that, and as I started meditating, as soon as I went there, everything in my face, the pain, gone immediately. So I stayed there, and then the Father goes, now meditate on every scripture about sonship, sonship, sonship. As I'm doing that, now the Father's giving me this message as though I'm speaking it to you, but I felt that it wasn't quite me. And so the message was, one, clearing the conscience. So that way we can receive that we have been forgiven, that we are the sons of God. Amen. And then it went from there into to, uh, boldness. And then it just went, and it went down this whole list. The Father, and I wrote the list. I get to church, <laughs> and Pastor gets on. The and this pulpit. is the dream you had. This right? is in the dream I had. Okay. Just clarifying that there. Yeah. It should sound like you were just meditating, but that actually was a dream. Yeah, yeah, this was a dream. So now we're here, and pastor gets on to the pulpit, and the first thing he does is just start praying in tongues. And immediately, I felt within me, uh-oh, I know what's about to happen. I know what's about to happen. And he starts to interpret. And everything he's interpreting is everything the Father was saying to me. Then his entire message was everything that the Father was saying Can in the I message. Can I just say this? Yes. <clears throat> that was one of the most powerful interpretations I've ever, when I talk about authority, it was like, it was like a Kim Clement prophesying. But it was a tongues and interpretation, which was, which was interesting. And it was, it was so powerful. I was like, I was ready to take a nap afterwards. <laughs> yeah. No, as you were saying, I don't know if anybody heard, but the entire time I was just like, whoa, yeah. And I was trying to, I had to put my sticks down because I didn't want to, you know, hit the, the, the gongs and everything. That's how excited I was. Man. And so from that, I then started, I saw how the father was commissioning everyone to understand that you are the son you are the son you're the son you're the son you are of that seed Amen. meditate that until you know that you know and you can take all of these scriptures because the father says it's not it's not nothing is impossible if you believe right 
So believe it. Understand it, that the Father is trying to tell you and tell us that we are his sons. Take the word, speak it, speak it, speak it, speak it. Because God's words are our words like he told Moses. And this is what the Father was showing me. Remember, I told Moses, I'm merciful and my mercy endures forever. Then Moses says the same thing to God when he's about to, you know, wipe out the Israelites. And then God says, according to your word. (laughs) So God's word needs to be our word, right? That's what that tells us. So taking that, and that's what you guys are doing here. You know, I'm seeing that like, oh, Father, you've already been moving. So I was sitting right here, if you don't mind, if I could just share one more thing. What? While we were sitting here and while we were praying, the Father was showing me and telling me that the eyes, of the blinders on our eyes and the, the deafness, the spiritual deafness today is removed. So you can receive that you are the son. So you can receive that you can speak God's words. And it happens the way he says it. That's that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah. That's good. Turn it off. Thank you, Adrian. There we go. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, it's funny, one day when AJ was, he was uh, sharing something, or doing something, I don't remember what it was, and I, I just said, I just called him the president. <laughs> and it was like he just felt right. And like, I said, I don't know if that's prophecy or not, but, but I think you're going to be the president. <laughs> like the 49th or something like that. Amen. And, um, can you imagine having a president like that? Yeah. It's interesting, we did a, a, I did an interview with AJ when he was on the subways, and he shared about um, there was a demon possessed guy in the subway, and um, the guy was going to attack him. And, you know, he's like me. We both did martial arts and stuff. So, you know, somebody's sizing you up. You know, you're thinking I'm going to do this, this, and this. You know, because <laughs> you're you're sizing them up, and you know what you're going to do. And um, <clears throat> and he said, and the guy started coming toward him, and he, his first thing was to get in his stance, <laughs> and but then the Holy Spirit came on him. And just changed him, and he shifted to love yeah. and, and prayer, and he began to bind the demon, and the guy just couldn't move. And it was a great, I don't know where you'd find it, but it's somewhere there on the YouTube or something. But it's, it's great. So many people have talked to me about that, so they just love when you did that. Amen. Um, that's like real life stuff. So I love that. All right, here we go. So I want to talk about how the gospel, we've been talking about healing. And there are several healing scriptures that everybody should memorize. They should know them, at least several, several of them. They don't have to know all of them, but what would be the first one? Well, that would be, but, but what, what, would, what's, what did First Peter come from? What was the original scripture? Isaiah, Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Surely is born our grief, sickness and disease, carried our sorrows, anguish, affliction, pain. So Isaiah 53... And then Matthew 8, 16 and 17, Jesus is healing the sick, casting out devils, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, talking back to Isaiah 53, that he bore our sickness. So Matthew 8 is the fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah 53, but Jesus had not yet taken the stripes. So he accessed the promise um, before it was fulfilled, kind of like Abraham accessed righteousness before Jesus had been resurrected. Then in 1 Peter, after Jesus takes the stripes, but he had already accessed, he had accessed the promise outside of time or outside of its season and brought it in when he walked the earth. <clears throat> then in 1 Peter, We have the covenant, Peter said, when he did take those stripes, the purpose of that was so that you would be healed. But it says that he gave us righteousness, who his own self bear our sins. So he bore our sins, and we all know that part, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness. Now, it's interesting that somebody somebody accidentally FaceTimed me uh, a couple weeks ago after that meeting because there was such a revelation of, I've, I've been forgiven. Amen. Because a lot of times when we're, if we're not healed or something's not working, we're, we're like, 
well, I've done something wrong or there's something not right. It may not be any of those things. You just, there may be some warfare. It just could be that your tree's growing, but it just doesn't, hasn't yielded fruit yet. It's still growing, but the fruit is yet to come. Amen. So don't, like, don't stop. But when they say, that, that person said that to me, I'm like, that is the problem with so many people with healing is we feel like we've got to work for it. Yeah. Or, or maybe somebody special has to lay hands on us. Maybe we need to go to a Benny Hinn meeting. Um, evangelists are for the unsaved, really. Yeah. But, you know, mostly the saved are going there to get healed. Why? Because they don't know who they are. They don't realize that they're sons of God. What did Jesus come, what did he come to do? He came to make you a son. Okay. So people get caught up in the old, and I'm going to ask you this question, and you're going to, whoops, you're going to give me the answers here. If I can, there we go. So in 2 Corinthians 3, It talks about the ministry of the old. What is the ministry of the old? Yeah. Law. Law. You guys all said it. Condemnation, which put con, and death. Yeah. Those are the ministry of the old. Even the Ten Commandments, because it says the law of commandments contained in ordinances, and it talks about engraving in stone. So even the Ten Commandments, which would be, you say that's the highest part of the law, or the most beautiful part of the law, or whatever, but it talks about them as well, that they would bring death. And it says, but even that old covenant that was under death had a glory to the point that Moses' face was shining. But you notice that people couldn't look at Moses. Why is that? Because condemnation. It wasn't just, oh, I need sunglasses, it's so bright. No, it was the condemnation when they looked at him, they saw the glory of God. There was no filter there. There was nothing to filter out. So in, in their flesh and blood bodies, in their unsaved souls, they felt condemnation and guilt. And a lot of times when we're born again, in our, your, your, your spirit is born again, but your soul and your body are not, you can feel guilt and condemnation because that's what you've been used to. And then when you hear the law, the law exacerbates it, and you go, oh yeah, that's the way I should feel. But it's not the way you should feel. Amen. So Jesus, when he comes, everybody could look at him. <laughs> and Hebrews is very clear that he was greater than Moses, but everybody could look at him. Even when he was resurrected, they could look at him. The only time that he was glowing was on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, Peter's on the ground going, let's build three tabernacles. <laughs> but they could still look at him. So what is the ministry in the same passage? He tells the ministry of the old, but what is the ministry of the new? The spirit and righteousness. Those two things. Those are the ministry of the new. That's the ministry of the new, the Holy Spirit and righteousness. That's why there's more scripture in the New Testament on righteousness than anything else. Because it is the ministry of the new. And it's learning to receive the forgiveness that God has given you, but it's not just that. It's the foundation within you that gives you dominion over demons. It's that, like, like a demon starts to manage. You have authority over them. Why? Because you're righteous. You possess God's righteousness. Righteousness is not just, I stand before God righteous by His grace and without condemnation. That's true. But it's more than that. It's the dominion of the sons of God that we have as the sons of God. Pastor, would you pray for me? Oh, pray for you, a son of God, empowered with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Word of God. Pray for you. What should I pray for? That I wake up. <laughs> Sorry. I carried away. Okay. Get back to some reality here. All right. So, um,
So Acts 10, verse 38. Now, before we read this, even though it's up there, you can read it. Jesus was the Son of God, right? Was he the first Son of God? No. No. Who was the first Son of God? Adam. Adam. So Adam had complete dominion over the earth, fish of the sea, fowl of the head, complete dominion over everything. And his offspring would also have that same dominion. He was the Son of God. Jesus is called the second Adam. So he was a son in the same sense that Adam was a son, except he was the only begotten son. Adam was created, he was born, but he was the word of God, so there was something different on the inside of him than maybe there was in Adam, but he was the height of the creation of God. Well, Adam was the height of the creation of God. Jesus was the creator of all things. So now you have the creator of all things combining with the height of the creation of God, that's two sons, into one son. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He's a new creation. That's something that's never been before. So Adam was one thing, but Jesus became something more. He became a combination. He was God and he was Adam or he was man. And that's what you are when Christ becomes part of you. Pray for me, Bob. Pray for me. I will pray. What are the prayers of Paul? See, when we pray, we're like, pray that the Lord will bless me or he will. No. You could just say, Lord, bless me. You could just say that, Lord, bless me. Or just say, I declare that I am blessed by the grace of God. Amen. But the prayers that Paul prayed... I pray that the spirit of wisdom and revelation, knowledge of him would come upon you, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you would know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and has made him the head over all things. To the church, that's you, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. That's a prayer. Now, that's the kind of prayer you could pray over somebody. What is it? Who they, that they would know who God is and they would know who they are. They would know the inheritance that God has given them. Why? So we can begin to declare to our world the kingdom of God. Jesus, would you teach us to pray? Okay. Father in heaven. What about Almighty God? You know, I don't know. He's your Father now. Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. How blessed is your name. Holy is your name. <sighs> Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here on earth as in. You're asking God to bring his kingdom. You're asking God to release his will on earth as it is in heaven. Who can ask for that? The angels can't ask for that. But you can ask for it. Why? Because Jesus said, you can ask for it. So we're praying for all kinds of things, but he's saying, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In other words, make the earth heaven. So, what are we saying? The Antichrist is on the way. Watch out for the Antichrist. Barack Obama's the Antichrist. <laughs> well, I remember when he became president, everybody's showing all the scriptures, he's the Antichrist. I was like, he's not the Antichrist. He's just somebody you don't agree with. Yeah. But, <clears throat> so the church, now, let's be honest, you really can't watch any modern movies, right? They're just garbage. But if you watch some of the old movies from like the 50s, especially the, fa- the space ones are really funny. But if you watch it, when they, ever, they do time travel, it's all, the future is always apocalyptic. It's always you know, it's overrun by zombies or something. It's always apocalyptic. Why is that? That's the devil's vision of the future. So the devil gave his vision of the future to the church and said, you need to have my vision of the future. And God says, I have a different vision of the future. 
ruled by my sons and my daughters. That's us. That's why Jesus, he didn't say, pray that when the Antichrist comes, you will have the faith to stand. Pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Then he said, then when you take care of that, he said, then pray, and I'm I'm quoting out of Luke, not Matthew. Then he said, pray day by day. Lord, give us day by day our daily bread. Give us that which is necessary for this portion of our life. So God's concerned about your needs. He's concerned about what you need on a daily basis. And he said, you can pray about that, but take care of his kingdom first. You know, Jesus, you know, sometimes he was a, don't do as I say, or, you know, he say, don't do as I do, do as I say. Because he didn't pray for his daily bread. Maybe he did, and we don't know about it. But he would just uh, kind of command things. Yeah. Hey, go get the water. So, you know, you know why he had them go bring the water in those certain vessels? Because that was a tradition of the Pharisees, and he was overriding the tradition of the Pharisees by doing that, by using those vessels, turning the water into wine. When he multiplied the food, he just blessed, said he blessed the food. What daily need did Jesus have? He could just declare anything. Well, aren't you him? Aren't we him? We are him. But we have to figure it out. Now, listen. Here's the problem with previous generations. Do you notice that every generation has a new language? That they have new words? You know, back in the 60s, it's everything groovy. It's all groovy, you know. <laughs> what a stupid word. But, you know, it worked in the 60s. And, and generations have their words, and they, they progress. But the kingdom generations also progress. So if you have been trained to be a slave your whole life, if you have been trained by the church to be a slave, that's who you are. So a slave is, help me, to the government. And the government is the pastor. Help me, help me, help me. Or the leadership. But in the Constitution of the United States, it's we, the people, of the United States of America. Oh, wait a minute. We're the ones in charge? <laughs> I thought the politicians were. No, no. We, the people, are the ones in charge. It's the same in the church. The people have the authority and have the dominion, but they've been trained. They've been trained to be slaves. So what's it going to take? It's going to take another generation coming up that doesn't grow up in slavery. Amen. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they had been slaves their whole lives, and they had come from generation of slaves. So when they went and they saw the enemies of the armies of Israel, they said, we are grasshoppers in their sight. And there were legitimate giants, don't get me wrong. They're, we are grasshoppers in their sight. And they said, we would, we would rather die in the desert or we'd rather go back to Egypt. Well, God wasn't going to take them back to Egypt because he delivered them from Egypt. But he said, all right, you're going to die in the wilderness. Because according to what you prophesied, that's what's going to happen to you. So who? Those that were 20 years old and younger, they didn't die. Those 20 years and older, they did die, except for Joshua and Caleb. Now, there's probably some others other than them. Why? Why did they die? Because they were slaves in their mentality. But the generation coming up walked in the desert as free men and women. Uh, so they learned what it meant to be free. And as free men and women, they had authority and dominion that when God sent them against the same armies, they didn't blink. So I like something that Kevin said. It's something that... (laughs) There's a couple things the Holy Spirit has been really leading me into. One of them is is trans relocation. I had the dream about it. And then the experience in Michigan. (laughs) And... um, Overcoming death. Yeah. 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 And it was interesting, last night, Kevin, Kevin said, I said, why aren't we living till we were like 140? Uh-huh. And stuff like that. It's like, well, that's, you're on the right track, buddy. <laughs> Just extend it a little bit. But he was talking about the next generations coming up because they're going to do things that we don't do. 
And that's what Bob Jones said. Bob Jones said in 2030, he said around that time, that generation was going to begin to overcome death. That means not only raising the dead, but not dying. But No, no, Bob, that can't happen. No, the Bible said, Jesus said, the last enemy that overcomes is death. Uh, So who's going to do that? Right. Okay, so think about this, because we're talking about healing. Think about this for a moment. When Adam ate of the tree, his body began to degrade, right? But it took almost a thousand years. Now, I realize that the atmosphere of the early earth was different, but it took almost a thousand years for him to die and everybody after him. So around that, around that time, people were dying and continued on that way until you get to Moses. Well, actually, that's not true. It's actually Abraham. When you get to Abraham, God calls him at 75. Why? Because at 75, all the pride that's in you is usually gone. I mean, I'm not there yet, but, but, but I'm just telling you, most of the pride that I have is gone. <laughs> yeah, I got a little bit more. Okay. So most of the pride as you get older, most of your pride is just gone. And all the things that you were so ambitious that you don't care about. And that, was, and that was Abraham. And that was Moses. Can you learn it when you're young? Well, sure. King David, he did. <clears throat> but Abraham, it says in Romans 4, when he was 100 years old, that his body now dead. So he, his body was at 100 years, it was like he, his body was in, in the throes of death. He was on the verge of death, transformed. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Well, Sarah's womb transformed. But I'll tell you what else transformed. Your womb just says, just like, hey, look, one part of my body is changing. The rest of me is the same. I feel different right here, but everything else is the same. No. Her whole body transformed. That's why kings would come out and say, hey, who's that hot chick? Yeah. Well, oh my God, I better tell this guy's my sister. He might kill me. Uh, that's my sister. Yeah. Would you like her? <laughs> yeah, I would. She's hot. All right. and God, God comes and visits him. He says, you better leave that man's wife alone. He told me it was his sister. Says, that's why I didn't kill you. Give him his wife back. And he goes, ask him to pray for you. (laughs) Why? Why was the liar the one that was going to pray for the one that didn't lie? Because he's the one that had the covenant. And that's what you need to understand is you're the ones that have the covenant. So even when you're not right, you're right. Ah. Amen. So their bodies transform. But now, now you have Moses. And this is the point that I really want to make. You have Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. Now Moses was directly in the presence of God, but they were right there with him. They were right next to him, close to him, in the presence of God. What happened? Joshua and Caleb, they didn't age. Well, actually, that's not true. They didn't death. In other words, death was stayed in the presence of God. So that shows me that even in an unborn-again spirit, Death could be stayed in somebody's body. What about if somebody had a born-again spirit that was filled with the presence of God? What could happen to their bodies? They could overcome death. That means a transforming of the soul has to take place as well. We could begin to overcome death. Even now. I'm telling you, the the last two times I went to the eye doctor, my sight... Reversed both times. Went went from here to here and then from here to here. Yeah. Gained an inch back in my height. Even when uh, uh, Jennifer was cutting my hair, I said, Bob, you got more hair. Yeah. Your hair's growing back in. Because I'm reversing age! Yeah. But really I'm not. I'm really reversing death. Yeah. Because I'm the, same, I'm the same age. Well, I'm a day older than yesterday. But it's not the age. So Joshua and Caleb, they did not have death. And they they were not born again. That shows us that in our body, that our bodies right now 
our bodies will react to a supernatural stimulant. Now, when Jesus walked the earth, people's bodies reacted to a supernatural stimulant of healing, and they were healed, but he's saying something more can happen. Now, Moses was even different than Joshua and Caleb. Moses was 80. He was done. He's out there walking in the desert. going. Uh, 40 years later, sees a bush burning, goes up there. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. <laughs> God starts talking to him. What happened to Moses? Well, we read the scripture earlier. Deuteronomy 34.7 said Moses was 120 years old. And you know what? He would not have died had he not struck the rock the second time. Yeah. He would have led the children of Israel into the land of promise. Yeah. But at 120 years old, he said, his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. That means that he went backward, that his body reversed death. That he wasn't just like uh, Joshua or Caleb who said, I'm 85, but I'm as good now as I was when I was 40. No, Moses reversed, and his eyesight came back, his natural strength, all that. When you're 80, your eyesight's not what it was. Your memory's not what it was. Nothing's what it was. He went back, he reverted his natural strength. That means his hormone levels, everything, his eyesight. He reversed death. Now, this was not the message on the docket today. Amen. But it's the message that God is saying to you. Yeah. Well, who can, who can teach me, Bob? Who can teach me? Let me think. Mm. Well, I know of a really good teacher. He's called the Holy Ghost. He will teach you. So, let's at least read a scripture and act like we're teaching something. It's okay, we quoted a lot of scriptures. So, Acts 10, 38. Peter is preaching about Jesus. And as he's saying who he is, he says, well, how this guy, Jesus, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. It's too bad the modern church wasn't anointed with the Holy Ghost. We might be able to change something. <laughs> Bob, I can't pray in tongues for two or three hours because I got, I got to watch SpongeBob SquarePants. Understand, I understand. <laughs> Jesus, listen. Jesus didn't do anything until he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. He didn't do any miracles before that. But what did he do? He went about doing good. So let's see, let's see what uh, God's version of good is. Uh, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So, so the devil's not good, we know that. Oppression is not good, we know that. Sickness is not good. We know that. Jesus was doing the opposite. He was doing good. Healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. In Mark 16, Amen. verse 15 through 18. Thank you, Dana. For 15 through 18, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, what a lot of people are preaching is not the gospel. It's the gospel of secular humanism. Uh, believe in Jesus and you will go to heaven even though your life on earth is hell. <laughs> and you have no power. Like any, any kind of movie that ever, you know, shows any kind of a religious person or holy person or whatever, they're like, and then they get vaporized. <laughs> like they have no power. Well, love is power. I mean, love, I mean, we're not supposed to be walking and kicking people in the head, but Love is power, but the gospel is powerful. Yeah. That he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. That is the sign of the believer. Why? Why? What for? I know you know this, but I just feel impressed to draw another picture. And it's only because I'm selling it for $100,000. <laughs> so let's say this is Adam. And 
And we know that we are spirit, soul, and body. So God, he breathes into Adam, into his spirit. He breathes, in, let's call this his body. He breathes into Adam, to the body, the breath of life, which is the spirit. And there becomes a connector between the two. It's called the soul. Okay. So Adam eats of the tree, and what happens? He becomes disconnected from the voice of God, or it becomes distorted. So now his spirit, whoops, his spirit can no longer feed life to the body. And the spirit operates through the soul to the body, but the spirit's supposed to overcome. But now, because the spirit is disconnected to God, it starts to lose its headship and the soul starts to take the dominion. He wears, starts to wear the crown in our life. And so now our soul is running our lives. Oh, I'm, I'm, Bob, I'm so worried. Oh, oh, really? You're so worried. Didn't Jesus say five, six times in Matthew chapter six, not to worry? Was Jesus worried? No. So he's telling us not to worry, but I'm so worried. What part of you is worried? Is that your born-again nature that sits on the right hand of the Father by Jesus? Is that part of you worried? Well, what part of you is worried? Soul. That's why he said that we're to take dominion over our soul by the word of God, Hebrews chapter 4. So the soul now is ruling both the spirit and... Well, let's change the color. The soul is ruling the spirit and the body... But the soul does not have life in it because the soul is a connector. Therefore, the body just starts to diminish. Starts going downward. But God... Is that pretty funny? It's your birthday, so you get to laugh. <laughs> but God's presence comes to the body of Moses, Joshua, and Caleb... And even though Moses' spirit and soul are not born again, the life of God that comes to the body of Moses begins to transform his body and death begins to leave his body, showing that <clears throat> a spiritual force can affect our physical bodies. You see that? So when you're born again, now your spirit <clears throat> has life. But your soul, for the most part, still wears the crown because it's you know, raised you up. You know, your soul is pretty much how you operate. Your soul is how you operate in this realm. When people go, if I could just see into the kingdom realm. Well, wait a minute, you can but your soul is connected to your body. So with your soul, you see this realm. And that's, what, that's how you were created. You were created to see this realm with your body and with your soul. But the spiritual realm, you were created to see with your spirit man. With the eyes of your heart. Remember the prayer in Ephesians 1. I pray the eyes of your understanding. One translation says, I pray the eyes of your heart. So that means we need to develop the eyes of our heart to see into the realm of the kingdom, because Adam could. Jesus also could, because he said, I do nothing except I first see my father do it. So we can see, and listen, you don't have to be a prophet or a seer or anything like that, or an apostle, to see, because everybody can see to a degree. You, and everybody may not be a seer, but everybody can see, but you have to practice. I was working with a, a woman, this was actually in Oceanside, we were doing a little Bible study, and she just, because I can't see anything, and I said, okay, so there's some new people that had come to the Bible study, I said, all right, stand up, and I had her stand up, and I, had this, I said, this lady, I said, stand up, because I saw her angel, I saw one of her angels, <clears throat> and so I said, I want you to close your eyes, and I go, I'm going to describe her angel, and I want you to, to, to visualize so I started describing what I saw, 
Bob, did you see it with your... Not with my natural eyes. If I saw it with my natural eyes, I'd been on the ground drooling. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. You, you have an open vision with an angel or something like that? Once you get picked up off the ground and you're going, don't die, I want to die, I don't want to die. <laughs> you know what you Yeah, my angel, we had lunch the other day. He had steak and I had eggs and we just shared with each other. Uh, uh, I don't think so. But, so I'm describing this woman, I don't know her, I'm describing her angel and her and her husband both go, that's exactly who, who I am. But it was her angel. I go, well, that's your ministry angel. I go, your personal angel looks a little bit different than that. But the woman goes, I can't see it. I go, I go okay, I go, use your imagination to the description that I gave you. I go, I know that you're just using the description I gave you to imagine. I go, but that's how you learn. Your imagination is actually the eyes of your spirit, but we haven't been trained to use our imagination. That's why most people never get healed because they don't see themselves healed. They don't see something change or something different. So God, our Father, Jesus, His Son, they together promise us the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, when you look at the promise of Jesus coming, the main promise was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, don't do anything else, go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. But, you know, they're like, they're like us today, wanting to know the future. Are you going to restore again the kingdom of Israel? Shut them down. That's not for you to know. Don't worry about that. But you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost. Come on. Here. They're, asking, they're asking for outward signs of a kingdom. He's saying, I'm giving you God, the Holy Spirit, to be with you. And they couldn't, they couldn't comprehend it. And most people don't comprehend it today. They're praying in tongues 10 minutes. And go, well, I didn't learn. I didn't get anything out of it. Or, Jared, you're making me laugh. Or they pray in the Holy Ghost. You know, maybe they didn't get baptized in the Holy Ghost, right? They go, unda bakabahata, unda bakata hata, unda bakata hata, unda bakata. Hey, you're saying the same thing over and over. I know, but I'm doing it for hours. <laughs> That's not really a language. That's the Holy Ghost, not the Holy Ghost. What? Why do people pray in the soul? Because the soul wants to retain their retention. Hey, listen, if, if you have been traumatized deeply in your soul, your soul wants to retain the control of your life. People don't realize that. So you just say, demon, demon. No, it's just a soul wanting to retain the control of your life. When you pray in the spirit, you're literally, your soul is giving the control of your life over to your spirit man who is being led by the Holy Spirit. So when you say, that is your spirit man with the Holy Spirit giving you the unction to speak the words of God. So now suddenly, the words of God and the life are coming back into your spirit man. But the Bible said that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost is connected to all three. So when I pray in the Spirit, my soul must submit. Yes. Well, Bob, I didn't, I didn't pray much in the Spirit today. Okay? That just means that your soul outdueled your spirit. Wow. That your soul took the dominion over your life that day. Wow. That your soul said, I will do what I want. And your spirit said, okay, I'll submit to you. Wow. <laughs> Did I just say that out loud? I thought I was just thinking that. I didn't think I said that. <laughs> well, Bob, now I feel guilty. No, don't feel guilt because that's, uh, that's condemnation. It's just going to make it worse. But now you can pray with a heavenly language and it's coming from the Holy Spirit into your spirit, going through your soul. Through, well, let's do this. Let's get this working again. Going, it, it comes from God into your spirit, through your soul, through your body, and it's a language that's coming out because your body has to be involved. And now 
you are surrounding yourself with heaven. You are surrounding yourself with prophecy because it says in Revelation 19.10 that prophecy is the spirit of Jesus Christ. But it says when you speak in an unknown tongue, you edify yourself. When you prophesy, you edify, edify the church. So prophecy, edify the church. Tongues, edify self. Right. Same thing. Bob, why don't we all speak in tongues 20 hours a day? Because our souls have the dominion over us. Now, I'm not saying you have to speak in tongues 20 hours a day. You've got to sleep and stuff. Although, I don't know if you did that. Maybe you wouldn't have to sleep. But the thing is, the more you pray in the Spirit, the more dominion you have over your soul, the less your soul takes authority in situations. Instead of going, instead of going hmm, what should I do in this situation? Suddenly, all of a sudden, you're doing something. I'm just like, what, what, what happened? Oh, your spirit took charge. Your spirit man took charge. Okay. Okay, what does that have to do with healing? Well, not a lot, but anyways, it's good. So, in my name, they, they'll cast out devils, they'll speak with new tongues. That's why you speak with new tongues. You bypass the soul, you take dominion over the soul, and put the spirit back in charge. <laughs> Bob, when I pray, it's just so hard for me. I pray for five minutes, it's hard. That's because... Your soul has so much dominion in your life. Listen, if you have fear in your life, soul. Worry, anxiety, soul. Your born-again spirit is Jesus. No worry, no anxiety, no fear, no sick. None of that is in your spirit. It's not in your spirit. And just as, just as Moses, who was living in a body that was, had death in it, and his spirit and soul were not born again, in the presence of God, it reanimated or brought life into his physical body, showing that you can bring life into your physical body from your spirit, from the presence of God. Do we get that? Did everybody get that? Okay. They shall take up serpents. That doesn't mean you sit and play with serpents. <laughs> because you don't see Jesus going, hey, everybody, look. It's, it's serpent playing time. <laughs> he never did that once. And it's, all, you know, it's funny that some of these cults are playing with serpents. If you believe. You know, believe. believe what? That you're stupid? Come on. <laughs> Chop that thing's head off. Anyways... The one encounter that we know of in the New Testament was Paul, a serpent, was hiding in the sticks that he picked up and it bit him. And it was a viper. That means it was deadly. Paul grabbed the viper, took it, and threw it into the fire. That's the only record we have. What he's saying here is you'll have divine protection from the elements. That's what that means. If you drink any deadly thing, now that's how people killed a lot of people back then. They just give them poison. He's saying, you'll have protection against people trying to kill you. So you have protection against the elements and the, the vipers and so on, and you have protection against people trying to kill you. He said, it will not, won't hurt you. He said, I will protect you as you preach the gospel. They said, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That is, listen, you have to understand, healing is a part of the gospel. There's no gospel without healing. It doesn't exist. Now, look at this. In Acts 4, he said, they're, you know, they're praying. They had, uh, they had healed the guy at the gate, and then they, went, you know, they kind of were brought before the Pharisees and the scribes, and so they threatened them. They begin to pray this prayer. This is just the last part of the prayer. It said, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hands to heal. Well, what's speaking the word? That's the gospel. Speak thy word by stretching forth thy hands to heal. The true gospel contains healing in it. Amen. And the signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Then we move on to Acts 14. Now this one is really powerful. It said, there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb. He's born this way 
who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and, listen to this, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. Um, where, where did he get faith to be healed? Oh, because Paul was speaking. Well, if he's saying, Jesus loves you, and he will save you from your sins, and you will go to heaven. If he's saying that, you don't have faith to be healed, saying that. He had to talk about how Jesus was healing the sick, and the sick were being healed. But what are you, what are you saying? I'm saying that there is a healing move of God about to sweep the land, Amen. and you have to talk about it. It's not going to happen just by accident. Amen. You have to start talking about it, yes. practicing it. Yes. And so Paul, he preached the gospel, and healing was part of what he was preaching because if it wasn't, how did this guy have faith to be healed? There is no gospel without healing. Right. It's, you know what it is? It's a false gospel. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. Amen. There's a lot of churches you could walk in in America right now and, and, and say, could somebody pray for me? I need healing. I'll never go, no. We don't believe in that. We believe it passed away. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of churches you can walk in and they'll pray for you. And, you know, say, I heard that Jesus heals people. Could you pray for Yeah, no, there's a lot of churches that will. But there's a lot. They, oh, no, no, it passed away. No, no. There is no gospel without... Healing is part of the gospel. There's no gospel without healing. They go hand in hand. Don't believe me? We're going to read some more. Matthew 4, 23. Jesus went about all Galilee. I wonder what he was doing. Teaching in their synagogues. I wonder what else. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So there's a difference between sickness and disease. A disease in your body or a sickness, a plague among the people. So this was Jesus' MO right here. You can look, it's right up there on the board. Teaching is what? It's revelation. Preaching is what? Inspiration. Healing is manifestation. And that's how it works. That's why when you teach on healing, you always have more people get healed when you teach on healing unless you just intercede people through. So now Jesus, he's sending his men out here, and, and this, is, this is really important. When he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits. Did they cast out every spirit? No, they failed to cast one of them out, and he said, well, this kind comes up by prayer and fasting. But he gave them the power to do it, so he gave the church the power to heal the sick, but is everybody in the church healing the sick? No, but they have the power to do it. Amen. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. That's what he sent his disciples out to. They weren't even born again. They weren't even filled with the Holy Ghost. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, the same chapter, Go not any way of the Gentiles, and unto any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. Wasn't there time yet. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely I've received, freely give. Amen. What was he saying? He said, Hey, see all this stuff I've been doing? Now that you've been watching me do it, you go do it. They were probably doing that with him. So they learned alongside him. That's why when I pray for people, I like people praying with me so they learn, pick it up. So that's the gospel. Now, we're going to end with this because I don't want to go too long. It's the first of four hours. Before I read this, it's, it's, well, I better not say that, but just stick to the point here. No, I was going to talk about aliens, but <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I don't think it's going to help your faith for healing. Maybe after, maybe afterwards we'll talk about it a little bit. Anyways, just know that when you see them or hear about them, that they are demonic. Yep. They are demonic. And... Um, yeah, just I, I brought it up because Kevin was talking about it a little bit last night. He listened to some of the same people I have. 
<clears throat> and have a lot of the same conclusions that they're, they're not extragalactical, they're interdimensional. But what do I do if an alien comes? Amen. In the name of Jesus, you foul, unclean creature. Amen. And I'll tell you, that thing's going to go running. Yeah. Right. There were people in our church that were in cults that had been kidnapped as children. And, you know, I don't want to tell you how that they indoctrinated them as children because it's disgusting. Yeah. There's things that you hear as a pastor, you just don't, you wish you could unhear them or unknow them. Now, they told me stuff that they did, and they, and they, they also had these um, hybrid aliens. And um, they said, well, we have these hybrid. I said, tell them I'd like to meet them. And I go, but don't tell them this part. I go, they're going to tell you no, they don't want to meet me. And they go, Bob, you were right. They didn't want to meet you. I said, it's not so much me they didn't want to meet. They didn't want to meet Jesus in me. Because he scares them to death. Don't worry about aliens. Amen. I have somebody that told me they were abducted, uh, more than one person. But I said, I said, so I just inquired a little bit. I said, um, where? What was he? on the way? I go, who you were with? Oh, so and so. Go. What does she connect? Well, her mother's a witch. And I go, well, there you go. You know that kind of stuff. I go, but you you say the name of Jesus or the blood of Jesus? I'm telling you what, these things are going to run back to their spaceships. Go back to the other dimension. Amen. They're just interdimensional beings. What do you think this? What do you think this is? We live in. We live in a dimension. What do you think the angels can walk through walls? Because they're they're from a different dimension, but to them our dimension is not that real because they're, they're from the ultimate dimension. So they can just walk through anything. Because this dimension it's real, but it's mostly air, so they can just walk right through it. And that's really easy for them to like pull sickness out of you. So let's look at what Jesus said here. It said, he came to Nazareth, and we're going to finish with this. Bobby didn't say it very much. I know, I, I, that's enough for today. Bring me an alien, and we'll have some fun. All right. <laughs> somebody, I hope somebody does it. I really do. <laughs> he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. I'll tell you what aliens don't want. I'll tell you what they hate. They hate people that pray in the Holy Ghost because right. <laughs> you're full of power. Amen. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, this means this is what he did. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read, and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Why? Because that's why they're, they're poor, because they need the gospel. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In other words, your day of salvation is at hand. Yeah. Your day of deliverance is at hand. That's what Jesus came to do. Now, doesn't the Bible say, you know, people quote that, yes, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, well, what about healing the sick? No, no, that passed away. But I thought Jesus was the same. Yeah, but he's in heaven now, so he's not doing it. No. Well, when he was in heaven, his disciples were doing it, and his disciples' disciples were doing it. Yes, but it passed away. It passed away because they can't do it. Well... Why can't they do it? Because they're not connected to the living God. They're connected to a system, a form of godliness that denies the power thereof. From right. such turn away. Right. It's a form or a formula of godliness. In other words, you follow these certain principles and formulas. Listen, forget that stuff. It's your relationship with God. Palmas right. Tipsu, a friend of mine, and we pray for people together. He had a powerful healing ministry. We prayed together. It was like our, the anointing doubled. It was so much fun. But he was dying of a brain tumor. And um, Hindus prayed for him, the Buddhists, the Muslims, nothing. And it was, I think he was in Sri Lanka. And uh, his brother-in-law said, hey, there's a, there's a Christian evangelist. 
You should come and hear him. So he comes and hears him, uh, and he gets healed. Now, he had been cursed by some witch doctor or something. His family, and a couple of them had died. But he goes there, and he gets healed. So he starts telling people that Jesus heals, and he's praying for people and having a Bible study. He didn't have a Bible. And then the Lord spoke to him, said, tell the people, by my stripes, they are healed. He goes, <clears throat> Jesus wants you to know by his stripes you're healed. Amen. And they started getting healed. And he goes, now, Bobby goes, sometimes they're real bad cancers. We would fast and pray. And he goes, and then we'd, we'd deal with the cancers. When he, the Lord told him, he said, uh, go to America to Christ for the nations. And so he came to America, couldn't speak a lick of English, didn't have any money, gets to Christ for the nations. He's, he's walking on the cam, cam, campus and a fireball comes, hits him in the chest. And suddenly he could speak English. He goes into the admissions office. Frida Lindsay, the wife of Gordon Lindsay, happens to be there and said, oh, I saw you and it was a vision or a dream. We're giving you free tuition. You don't necessarily have to know a lot, but, but a little bit of supernatural is more than a lot of knowledge. He had no, he, he had no uh, you know, doctrines of any kind, really. He just believed in Jesus, and he was healed. And if you believe in Jesus, you will take healing to the sick. Listen, God, people, are, people are, are starved. People are afraid. They're scared. Whenever I have conversations with people, I always open up by talking about the future because people, Hollywood has given them an apocalyptic future and the church has given them an apocalyptic future. So I start telling them about the kingdom, the future of the kingdom. Amen. Amen. And then if they need healing, if it, sometimes it leads to healing, I will, I will go to that direction. Amen. But when you pray for somebody and they're healed, that changes things. So you've been sitting a while, let's stand up. Now listen, I sat for four hours last night without standing up. For those of you watching at home, we love you so much and appreciate you. For those backslidden buzzers going to the Super Bowl, we love you too. And we appreciate you. And um, I pray for everybody here, but also those that are watching. I pray that God's grace would be with you this week. I pray that his mercy and peace be with you. And I pray that his kingdom, his righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit would be with you. And Dana, you better keep on prophesying. I just feel to tell you that. You better keep on prophesying. Amen. Keep on prophesying. Don't, don't, don't not prophesy. <clears throat> Other than that, have an awesome weekend. I know I will because I'm staying here to watch Super Bowl with one of my dear friends on an 85-inch television. <laughs> so, you're dismissed. God bless you. <laughs>